A warm welcome to this uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Karin Arteson and I am the scientific director at the National Veterinary Institute in Sweden. In these times, we worry about a lot of things such as ongoing war, the economy, global warming, but we are also concerned about our personal well-being and want to live long, healthy lives. This past year, I was leading the program preparations for the Uppsala Health Summit on healthy lives from sustainable food systems, which took place at Uppsala Castle in October 2022, with around 200 food and health experts from civil society organizations, industry, public sectors, and participants from the academia. Together, we explored the obstacles and possibilities associated with the pathways towards sustainable food systems. It is with satisfaction I now can say that I think that this conference has contributed to find solutions of relevance for some of the things I and others worry about. A sustainable food production and consumption we not only support healthy lives, but also an environmentally friendly way of living. The conclusions from the intensive dialogues that took place at Uppsala Castle in October last year have been gathered in a post-conference compendium or brief. It's this one, and in here you find different briefs from the different workshops and an executive summary. Uh, today is uh, an opportunity for us to officially launch this report. But most of all, it is a chance to continue the important discussion with a special focus on how to build long-term resilience and how we stay on the path towards change in a turbulent world. I am happy to introduce our moderator, Ann-Sophie Wallström, from the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences and their platform, Future Food. Welcome, Ann-Sophie. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Karin. Um, it's really good to be here, and I'm looking forward to continue the important work that we started in October. So, um, how do we achieve a transformation to a resilient food system? Well, we have an hour to discuss this very thoroughly, so we will do our best. On a daily basis, I work, as Karin mentioned, with SLU Future Food, a platform um, where we want to develop thinking around ecological, uh, economically and social sustainable food system. Uh, one very important part of that is to facilitate dialogues that gives our different views into these very complex issues. During the summit in October, we hosted a workshop where we were focusing on the future of meat to see into different future scenarios. What could be a future for meat consumption or meat production? And um, meat has a very important part from a nutritional point of view, important from a cultural aspect, as well as having some challenges from the um, planetary boundary perspective, for instance. But we will have time today to discuss about future uh, scenarios, future aspects, consumer attitudes, and perhaps the possibility of eating ourselves out of this not so sustainable food system. Um, to help us do that, we have two speakers today. It is first uh, Professor Lene Gordon. She's um, executive director at Stockholm Resilience Center. She will help us to frame the discussion that we have today, a very important task. Um, and then to help us further, Nicole Rock from Good Food India. She also attended the summit in October and she participated with her view and knowledge of food innovation and how we can shift people's attitude on how we consume and conceptualizing food for a more sustainable diet. So I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting hour. 
with that, Lena, I'd like to give the, not the floor perhaps, more the space, the Zoom space to you, please. Thank you, and thanks so much for the invitation to speak here today. Uh, I, everything I've heard about this um, summit has been fantastic, and you seem to have had really interesting discussions. Today, I will try to share uh, a few um, thoughts around um, the transformation to more and healthy, to more healthy and sustainable uh, food futures, but especially focusing on this time of increasing risks and uncertainty that we live in today. Um, and as we all are aware of, we really need unprecedented scale of actions at the moment. I think the IPCC reports that uh, were, that was released just a few weeks ago, uh, summing up the challenges that we're facing as a humankind really puts a finger of, of the urgency of action. I mean, IPCC has for the last year emphasized that we live in a time where there is a rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all on this planet. It's a really serious task that we're facing. I think this graph that was published in the latest uh, summary report is, is one that to me is the most starking of, of all the graphics that they have been publishing, but really looking at um, how uh, the, the expectations of how the world will be different for the children that are born today uh, when they grew up as what it has been for us who were born uh, in, uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. So while people like me born in the 70s have been experiencing increasing extreme events and increasing heats, it's nowhere near what my uh, children will be experiencing when they grow up. Uh, what IPCC is also emphasizing is that food systems have such an important role to play, both in terms of mitigation and ad adaptation. In just this graph uh, illustrating the scale of possibility that we have if we shift how we uh, manage our land, how we manage our production on food, and the possibility it has to, to uh, contribute to net uh, emission reduction. Um, here we see also both, so this is on the production side, but also on the demand side, we see large possibilities in shifting food systems in order to improve our climate um, um, into the future. But of course, climate is only one of the many variables that we need to account for when we think about sustainable food systems. Uh, we looked at the role of food in transgressing the planetary boundaries. And if we look at how much we already have been transgressing from the food system, we know that climate stands for around 25% of all the uh, um, um, climate emissions. Um, that it's around 75% uh, of the drivers for land use change. Biodiversity uh, around 75 to 80% come from the food system. When it comes to nitrogen and phosphorus, it's almost all of what's driving this current very dramatic um, uh, impact on the planetary boundaries for nitrogen and phosphorus, but also 70% of the water. So sustainable food system requires rapid change, but of course we know that it's the same for health. And I know you've been discussing this so I'm just, uh, during the summit, but just iterating uh, a bit on that, that we're very far from achieving the sustainable development goals. Here's just looking at the trends when it comes to the indicator on, of obesity. So where in the world are we on the right track, those are shown in green, where are we on the wrong track, and those are shown in red. So we see large shares of the world where we're really on the wrong track of even getting closer to meeting the sustainable development goal. And, we, and th this is only seven years uh, away from now, right? Also, when we look at the goal for hunger, we're really far away from, from meeting the goal, uh, the SD SDG on hunger. Here's some uh, analysis of 
um, the COVID crisis that really took us away from, from the, even further away from reaching it. But what they're emphasizing is that even without COVID, we, we would have been really far away from meeting this goal. So securing a healthy and sustainable uh, food system is, uh, has to be a really top priority on everyone's agendas. There's been many studies saying that it is also possible to really have a healthy uh, food system that is produced within planetary boundaries. The Eat Lancet was one of them uh, published uh, four years ago, basically showing that it's potentially possible to feed 10 billion people a healthy diet within planetary boundaries, but the, the scale of change is substantial. This publication has been followed up with many different publications looking at the role of food and the planetary boundaries, the role of food for um, meeting the Paris Agreement, for meeting biodiversity targets and for meeting sustainable development goals. I think what they all uh, come together, all of these publications emphasize is that we basically know where to start and we need to address four things simultaneously to be able to achieve these goals. So we need to shift diets. And of course, this will look very different in different places around the world, but dietary shift is an important part of the puzzle. And we need to cut food loss and waste uh, and move towards much more circular systems. We need more sustainable production systems and we need to manage and protect nature. So this is in some ways, we're all in agreement we know it's an enormous challenge we're facing, but I think what we're not talking about enough is that at the same time that we need to make this transition happen, the risk landscape for food system is also changing and it's changing dramatically. Um, if we look at how much people have really transformed the biosphere, I mean, we, we change the way that the ecosystem works so fundamentally. I think one of the starkest numbers of the scale of change that we have uh, done to this biosphere is if we look at the, um, the animal population on this uh, earth. So if you take all the mammals that live on this planet, it's actually the weight of the mammals, if you look at that, it's actually 60% of that weight that is livestock. 36% of that weight are, is humans. And it's only 4% of all the mammals on this planet today that are wild mammals. If you look at the uh, bird populations, 70% of the weight of all birds globally is from pr production uh, birds, so chickens and other poultry, and only 30% are wild. So this is just an illustration. It's not saying that it's good or bad. This is a way also to feed us and have the type of food system that we have today. But it shows the scale of change that we are having and the, um, on this planet today. So with this change, we really uh, changed ecosystems in three main ways, I would say. One is through simplification. One is through intensification and one is through hyperconnectivity. So we're also uh, changing the connections between systems uh, through the mobility of people and mobility of um, uh, uh, trade um, and products. And what this uh, um, change has led to is increasing our vulnerability and lowered our resilience. Sorry. Um, so while we simplified systems and it made them more uh, or less resilient and more vulnerable, we also see the increase of different shocks that are um, um, having an impact on our food system. A few of these, of course, is the COVID pandemic. We see supply chain disruptions. We see escalating escalating food price crisis. We see the Russian invasion of Ukraine in one of the world's largest bread baskets. We had the Brexit, the impact that had uh, on uh, um, 
flows of goods and services across nations, uh, etc. This is a, a world where these type of shocks are really increasing. And at the same time, we have the increasing shocks. We also have sweeping changes that are affecting our ability to be, uh, deal with these crop shocks. So climate change, biodiversity loss, uh, and we also live in, in a world of a post-truth uh, era with rapid polarization. So how these different things are interacting is of course that it's also driving uh, this vulnerability even more. So for example, uh, we have climate and conflict interacting, uh, making uh, local food production shocks uh, more present. In other areas, we see climate with the COVID pandemic conflict uh, uh, disrupting uh, trade, export bans on key food product commodities. And in other areas, uh, or in most of the world right now, we see higher energy and fertilizer prices. And all of these things are interacting to give us a, um, a really a global food crisis. And we know this food crisis so far has resulted in 345 million people that are estimated to suffer from acute food insecurity across 82 countries. And this is an increase with 200 million people compared just to the pre-pandemic estimate. Some of the things that I worry about in this, uh, this new uh, world of increasing shocks and increasing increasing change and reduced resilience are as just one example is that we are today relying on such few crops uh, in only a few bread baskets around the world. So we have basically four crops, wheat, rice, maize, and soy, that account for half of the food calories worldwide. And a majority of these crops, depending on what crop you pick, 40 to 75% of the production of that crop is produced in just five bread baskets around the world. Um, and if you look at climate change and the risk for climate change uh, affecting uh, and having extreme events in these bread baskets, uh, studies have been done that has shown how the risk for uh, the probability of having synchronized extreme weather events in several of these bread baskets have already increased with somewhere between 30 and 300 percent from where it used to be um, uh, uh, earlier. Um, and that this increase of risk for synchronized weather events are um, increasing further with the uh, up till 1.5 and 2 degrees warming, and will of course escalate after that and become even worse. So we see a large being dependent on few regions where we have the risk of having a crop failure happening at the same time. Another type of risk that we see in this very interconnected system is that a lot of the production is also passing few passing through only a few uh, uh, places globally. So 80% of the traded production actually passes through these maritime uh, uh, ports. And here is an example of um, the critical uh, places around the world where large shares, where you see the, the numbers here, it's the amount of production that passes through these different straits. So what would happen if we had blockages similar to what happened with the ever given in March uh, 2021? Uh, several of these places being blocked at the same time. That's also a new type of vulnerability that shows how a hyperconnected system also has a lower resilience. So with this uh, increasing risks, so the lower re resilience, we really need to find areas for mobilizing uh, for resilience. And it's beyond the time I have today to talk about what we need to do. And I think what I'm really emphasizing is that we need to invest much more in thinking about this new type of vulnerability and, high, and, and risks that we're facing. 
Well, two of the key things that, that, uh, that we need to move on is first, it is even when we're facing this type of crisis and uh, new type of vulnerabilities, we really need to maintain the focus uh, on a food system transformation for health and sustainability. Here's from a paper that was published uh, maybe a year ago um, on the need to uh, accelerate shifts to healthier diets, the need to increase production of legumes and strength, sorry, strength, ah, I happened to switch the slide too fast, sorry. But uh, that we need to basically maintain the, the, the focus on healthier and sustainable diets because that will also make us less vulnerable to this type of shocks uh, that we are facing. Uh, here's another study that is showing how the transitioning to what they um, looked at uh, the Eat Lancet diet in Europe and UK, how that such a transition would completely reduce the need for import from Russia and Ukraine as an example of where transitioning to more health and sustainable diets would actually make um, as more resilient also to some of the risks that we're facing now globally. I think we also need to start, uh, uh, I think we also need to start looking at how we build resilience uh, both to specific shocks but also more in general and there's quite a lot of literature on the type of principles for, that are underlying a more resilient food system or a more resilient uh, system in general. One of these uh, analyses um, have been identifying seven different principles for uh, building resilient systems. And they are emphasizing uh, the need to maintain diversity and redundancy, the need to manage slow variables and feedbacks, the need to manage connectivity, uh, the importance of fostering uh, thinking around complex and adaptive systems, to encourage learning, to broaden participation, and to promote polycentric governance as some of the key areas where we really need to strengthen our focus. Uh, one of the areas that always come up in, in discussions on how to build resilience is the importance of maintaining diversity and redundancy. Uh, and I think that is also one of the most basic and fundamental aspects of building a more resilient food system. There was a study published just a, a few months ago about the importance of blue foods in diets. And I think as we discuss also the future of food, it's important to uh, really emphasize the role of blue foods uh, in our diets. And one of their main emphasis was also the diversity of blue foods uh, in our diets and that we, we could uh, increase the role of blue food um, uh, much more in future diets if we also ate much more diverse type of uh, blue foods um, and much more diverse types of species. They also illustrated that the role of blue foods uh, have in both reaching health uh, goals and sustainability goals and safeguarding food system contributions uh, across the world and how the different relative roles of blue food uh, for these different policy goals are different in different parts of the world but basically blue foods are relevant for different reasons all across the, the world. So in just summing up uh, in this uh, talk, um, unprecedented actions on food systems are needed. The risk landscape for food systems has been changing and we need to pay much better attention to how this risk landscape is changing. We really need to build resilience where diversification is one of the keys. While we're doing that, we also really need to stay on course for more healthy and sustainable food systems. So with that, I just want to say thanks and hand it back over to you, Anne-Sophie. Thank you. Gosh, Lina, um, thank you. Um, first, a very quick question from one of the audience. Explain blue food, what is it? 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, I should have been more. Maybe I was too too stressed with getting through my presentation. Sorry. But blue food is basically all the food that come from the ocean and the aquatic system. So uh, the reason we uh, often we just talk about fisheries, but of course the oceans and the uh, aquatic system have so much more to offer. Uh, um, algae, um, shellfish, uh, mussels, etc. Yeah. So it's all of the type of food sources and nutrition we get from oceans and, yeah. and aquatic. Everything system. we know today and perhaps what's coming as a possibility in the future from absolutely the oceans. Thanks. Mm. Um, so obviously, you know, you're stressing the urgency of doing something. You're talking about the windows closing. We need to shift. Mm. And I think we're going to come back to that question because I guess we're not going to, you know, but what can we do? Because you also said it's possible, it's necessary. Mm. And we all still feel like we are just standing, you know, we're not doing enough. Mm. Um, could you give us some, you know, ideas of what is actually going on to get some hope into this? Mm. Oh, no. No. <laughs> no, think there are so many things going on and of course it's so easy to say everyone needs to act everywhere kind of but yeah. I think it's really about uh, um, I mean one, one of the slides I realized I, I kind of skimmed over was uh, the the role of repurposing agricultural subsidies that it's so much of our current agricultural subsidies that are subsidizing crops that are actually not uh, contributing to the, the um, healthier and sustainable diet. So 80% mm. uh, of the sub subsidies in the European Union are uh, going into the crops where we don't need to see an increase uh, of production. So basically most of the staple crops of, of wheat and maize, etc. They need it in a, in a diet, but we, that's not where the major shifts will happen. While, for example, we need much more production of um, uh, pulses, legumes, uh, uh, etc. We would need to develop our seeds, um, uh, seeds and um, our uh, nut production and make that much more sustainable and healthy. So you could also see this repurposing uh, agricultural subsidies into more healthy crops, for example, is one of those uh, areas. Yeah. Because I keep thinking that, you know, if you're, you're drawing all this picture about the urgency on the world and global, and then we also have the, the SDGs that we are, you know, all focusing on. And I keep thinking that they are not so far away. How do you think that that will, I don't know, align or, or kind of strengthen each other going forward? Because as we move forward, will it be stronger focus on these SDGs or do you think we're just planning already to kind of move them ahead because we want to see them you said we're almost walking in the wrong direction now yeah I it's it's a very good question and I I don't know I I guess uh, with the millennium development goals we had before there was also a sort of a reorganization of them and maybe it is the time also to think about what are coming after the SDGs uh, but that doesn't mean that we should stop uh, trying to achieve them. I mean, we, these goals are set for a purpose. It's about making the planet a better place to live for everyone, uh, everyone on this planet. And I think those ambitions, we, that's not anything we can let go of. Uh, I think more, now more than ever, we need that discussion of how do we make a a living possible on this planet for everyone in a much more just and equal way than what we ever had before mm -hmm. so so maybe there will be renewed discussions and some reprioritization but uh i i i i'm sure we have some uh we'll we'll see a continued effort on mm -hmm. global goals yeah mm -hmm. um you're mentioning that you know the three areas where we need to focus and where we can also make a big difference is the healthier diets, eating different, more legumes, perhaps, uh, as you're mentioning now, uh, perhaps uh, growing other crops, but then also reducing the food waste. And mm. to me, all these three seem to be rather reasonable to do actions mm. on. Um, and I know it's probably difficult to 
elaborate on but why is it so difficult to do this because they're rather specific mm. yeah <laughs> it's like yeah <laughs> no but i think uh, uh, i mean things are of course there are things that are happening and we see new innovations coming in lots of the, i think there's lots of hope also in the private sector taking initiatives and looking for innovations in making the systems much more circular um using uh, waste uh, as um uh, new resources in new ways um, etc um but of course there's lots of barriers to this shape uh, change lots of misinformation lobbying campaign trying uh, trying to stay um people defending the status quo uh so it's um yeah i think also yeah so there's lots of barriers that are uh, in the way for achieving this uh, things yeah because i was thinking also you mentioned these um choke points you mentioned it for the maritime mm. the infrastructure they're being very vulnerable in some areas and mm. also our um with the the food baskets or what do you call them on, on different areas and it's very visible for every one of us that these are very vulnerable way of having a food system mm. can you see on system level how we could change that into being more resilient just by i don't know like the infrastructure yeah i mean i think we need to realize how how um vulnerable this is or how, how few these kind of choke points are and therefore i think that's also why I emphasized the role of diversity and diversification and and uh, redundancy basically being a really important part uh, of building future food systems. Um, so I think f trying to understand like what are the alternative uh, pathways that the food can through th flow through globally but this is a first kind of map of trying to understand just what does it look like now where do we have the vulnerabilities and then of course around that you need to then sort of diversify and look for alternative uh, areas where uh, hmm. yeah the the reason for us being in this system today just keep me thinking you know is that because this is the most economic way of producing food or why did we set ourselves in this situation to start yeah. with? Yeah, well, I think the economic, uh, the cost of um, uh, food uh, is one of the reasons. This is an economic uh, way of producing food, just as you're saying. But one reason that it is, is because there are so many external costs that are not included in the in the price of food or the price of production. So all of this uh, environmental impact uh, that we see from the food system, if, if we would put the true cost of food, so include them in the, um, uh, in the prices, then food, then the uh, more sustainable pr production would of course become much more um, relative more uh, cheap versus what we see today um, so in yeah true cost of food is one one of the main ways also that we can work uh, moving forward um, and I keep thinking in the direction that um, do we need to to compromise now if we want to to change into a sustainable or resilient food system Probably on 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 individual level, we need to compromise or change, but we also need to perhaps compromise in the way we see. And I know in the workshop, and I look at, at Karnia, I know in one of the workshop during the summit, we were talking about lowering or or the conflict between food safety mm. standards versus the need to consider uh, and how we can ensure like food security. Uh, and today we. We know that um, we have a certain standard, but if there is a need for more food, can we lower one standard or one way in order to achieve a benefit in something else? And that will be a conflict between SDGs, for instance. Do you have any comment or do you remember what we were talking about on that workshop, Karin? 
Yeah, <clears throat> uh, sometimes there is food enough, but the quality is too low. And uh, <clears throat> for instance, when, when food is produced in Africa, they export food to Europe, but, but when the uh, quality, for instance, because of mycotoxin levels in food is too low, then they cannot export the food. And then it ends up with that the region, the people in the region uh, eat that food instead. Uh, and that is, of course, a conflict because then they get food enough, mm. but maybe not the healthy lives. Yeah. Uh, and um, yes, the SDGs, they are interconnected, but in a way that sometimes they get into contradiction to each other. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's a problem. And I'm thinking if you also elaborate on that a bit further, so you then in regions where, where they are um, in a good economic situation, they could pay for the food security and the food safety. And, and that will be, um, is there then a risk that it will be even bigger differences globally in food availability? On I, I think so in the future because of climate change. Yeah. Because mm. there, are, there are drought, there is uh, lots of rain and other disasters that affect food mm. quality. Mm. And some parts of the world will be more affected than others, I'm sure. Mm. Mm. And I'm thinking that, Lena, looking forward to your the scenario that you described for the future, or the situation that we are today, mm. can you see like other similar um, compromises or um, conflict between perhaps I don't know specifically here about the SDGs, but it could be other interests or other areas that we need to compromise going further or going forward. Um, yeah. And perhaps think... even moving away from, you know, we will end up further away from what we actually want to go because we need to do these compromises. Uh, yes. I, I think maybe it's my, I, I think I, I see more synergies than, than yeah, conflicts well, in some yeah. ways. But that doesn't mean that there won't be uh, difficulties in uh, mobilizing for this action. Uh, so um, uh, just with there's so much uh, showing that a sustainable diet is often a healthy diet, or there are dietaries that are healthy and sustainable. So why put them sort of as conflicts, for example? It could there can be um, um, conflicts, but they're often they go together. Um, a healthy diet can be a cheaper diet in many places around the world. In a few places, it will be a more uh, expensive diet, but then the, what are the ways that we can then kind of raise um, the affordability of that diet still in those areas. So there are, I think we tend to focus on the places where there are these tensions rather than finding where are the synergies and where do they go together? And let's try to uh, steer towards that. Um, so uh, yeah, I, there was an article in the Swedish newspaper recently because the price of Sweden has gone up dramatically over just the past year. And it was highlighting how in schools uh, now um, children didn't get their favorite meals anymore because uh, they had to shift uh, uh, food in the canteens uh, because food prices had gone up so much. But if you looked at how, what they're shifting to, it was actually much more healthy choices. So instead of serving cucumbers and tomatoes that are not so nutrient rich, they were uh, serving cabbage and legumes. Mm -hmm. And instead of serving meat almost every day, they were serving two times a week. They had vegetarian uh, dishes. So mm -hmm. th that's actually a positive shift. But the way that it was portrayed in media is as if this is a negative thing because the children doesn't get what they are used to. or, or mm -hmm. So that's an example of the positive side of the shift, but it's portrayed as a negative consequence. Yeah. yeah. But that's good. And, and I, I saw that we had a question regarding the price on healthy diets also to make sure that that is not uh, something that drives differences. So you can only, you know, you need to have a certain economic situation in order to be able to eat healthy and, mm. and food from a sustainable produced way. 
Mm. Um, we also had a question regarding what what do we mean with a shift of diets? Mm. Uh, a shift we're talking about healthy diets, but to a sustainable diet because I think that's also a way if you could just give you mentioning I think nuts and legumes and stuff. But what does it mean? Is that we need to eat to a certain amount and not affect the planet more, or can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I think it is about uh, yeah, exactly shifting. Um, it, it depends so much on where you are in the world. So also, yeah. I, I know I'm coming with a very Swedish and Western bias, but but it, for example, here in Sweden, it would be shifting, uh, reducing the amount of animal-based uh, products, for example, and eating much more plant-based. So uh, that's one of those uh, shifts. And then sourcing it for more, sustainably produced areas so maybe more organic or more uh, based on uh, yeah from a farming system that is more regenerative uh, for example yeah. because we also got the question you know a healthy diet is that the same everywhere and I keep thinking that is also what you mean by it is that if it's a healthy diet from a, um, a dietary perspective and nutritional wise then I'm thinking that we are humans with the respect that I'm not um, specialist on this area at all mm. but if we're talking about sustainable diets could that be different than uh, globally eating mm. and I think the diets can be I mean a diet can on on some very general level it can be more or less the same like we need to eat a certain amount of fruits and vegetables every day but the the fruits and vegetables we eat will differ depending on where you are in the world uh, so in that sense you can or we eat a certain amount of green every day and I think greens will whole greens will be part of everyone's healthy diet to some extent mm -hmm. but the type of greens we eat can be different in different parts of the world so in that sense you can compose your plate very differently depending on where you live but they still can be sort of in some ways similar mm. uh, and then of course whether um, it depends on how much trade it is also uh, to what extent uh, the, for sustainability it differs in different regions um, if it's a globally traded food system of course it's more or less the same uh, because we source food from similar areas but yeah um Thank you, Lina. We will come back to more discussion, but I think it's an excellent time now to in, uh, welcome Nicole Rock into this discussion when we talk about differences on the food plate and uh, innovation and how we could actually conceptualize a sustainable diet. So please, Nicole, um, so the Zoom area is yours. Thank you. Uh, Lean, thank you firstly for laying out that problem so comprehensively. It's a very paradoxical as well as a wicked problem that we're all facing with our food system right now. Um, to begin with, I just want to give a brief introduction about um, who I am and where I work. So I work for a non-profit organization called the Good Food Institute India. And our work at the Good Food Institute India is lies at the cross section of food innovation and markets to bring about a transition in the way that our food is currently being produced. Um, so the question that we're looking to answer through our work is how do we feed 10 billion people, one sixth of whom will actually be in India uh, by 2050 um, without further exacerbating some of these problems that Lean already um, very comprehensively laid out. Um, the latest IPCC report that was released a few um, weeks ago um, highlighted that four, highlighted four uh, highlighted eight actually um, di um, direct changes that governments across the world would need to make to avoid a complete climate catastrophe. And four of those eight changes have direct implications on the way that we produce meat, eggs, and dairy. So in order to cut methane emissions, in order to halt deforestation, to prevent agricultural sprawl, and shift consumption towards more plant forward diets, we need to leverage a growing pool of solutions offered by food science and innovation 
that is enabling us to create the same meat, eggs, and dairy that consumers love and want, um, but using crop ingredients, fermentation technology, and animal cellular agriculture. While it's essential to supplement um, current protein sources away um, from animal-based foods to de-risk our food systems, in India um, and in you know, the broader um, emerging market context, we also have a very unique opportunity to aim these technologies at improving agri resilience through biodiversity, diversifying farmers' incomes by introducing different crops and lucrative end markets for those crops, and then finally driving access to nutritious foods to a wide uh, majority of the population who don't currently have access to those foods um, the way things currently stand. Um, however, in saying that, um, it's easy to look at food innovation as a catch-all um, solution to everything that we're facing, but it's not. I think um, the biggest problem that we face um, as an organization that's working to um, advance some of these innovations and contextualize some of these innovations for um, the markets that we work in is that food cultures are built on larger themes of provenance and history of memory of community of tradition and it's not easy to shift someone's attitude towards what they're consuming um, it's essential that we need to understand local norms and food cultures before we're able to go in um, and propose a specific food innovation or food solution um, as a solution either to um, various various issues we're facing in the broader food system or even in terms of local issues that we're facing in terms of health and sustainability um, so i would say in terms of the you know how we can push forward this kind of adoption towards these innovative foods that can have certain benefits i would say the first thing that we need to be thinking of is localization so utilizing local crops, innovating on product formats so that they look different um, in Sweden than they do in India um, and vice versa. Um, innovating on regional variability in terms of flavors and taste profiles will be imperative um, in order for anyone to even conceptualize adopting some of these foods into their diets. And then beyond unlocking familiarity and appeal of these innovative new foods, um, uptake will largely depend, of course, on cost and ease of access. So whether we're thinking about cost in an emerging market context or we're thinking about cost um, in a global north context, um, if these foods are more expensive um, than foods that people are used to adding into their grocery carts every week, it's unlikely that they'll go back and continue to um, adopt these foods into their daily diet. Um, apart from that, I think policy also has a huge role to play, both policy as well as regulation. Um, I think it's undeniable that anyone who cares about nutrition and cares about the living world at the same time will have to interact with what these food innovations are to ensure that they're fairly and openly accessible to the people that need it most. And I think this is where policy and regulation really needs to come in. I think more and more as we think about um, climate and food, these two need to be very um, closely interlink uh, interlinked um, to ensure that we're thinking both about food security as well as in terms of climate security um, as our climate crisis worsens and um, you know, things shift globally. Um, like I mentioned, we're also faced with unique issues here related to a lack um, of protein deficiency in our diets as compared to maybe a global north diet where there's um, an overconsumption of protein. So those considerations also need to be taken um, in mind and a cookie cutter approach for different countries will not work. And so when we're thinking about food systems and we're thinking about transforming food systems, there really is a need to analyze how innovation can actually support in the development of various national development goals. So whether it's the sustainable development goals that we all have targets towards achieving by 2030, 
or its national development goals set by various different um, governments in different parts of the world, we really need to be thinking about how we can leverage these innovations to support those innovations, to support those goals. So something that we're doing, our partners in Brazil are doing, for example, is they're mapping out different indigenous crops um, that can potentially be used to preserve local biodiversity, but can also be reformatted in a way um, that makes it delici delicious and um, it's nutritious and people want to consume it. We're doing something similar in India called the Indigenous Agriculture Initiative, where we're really looking at different crop sources like pulses and millets. And again, seeing how we can formulate these products um, to look familiar to people and look um, enticing enough for them to want to pick it up and eat it and nutritious enough um, so that we're not, we're, not, we're not repeating the same mistakes that we have um, over the last um, 50 years. Um, apart from that, I think public and private finance will play a major role. The biggest and most critical bottleneck towards achieving a food system transformation of this kind is access to capital. And financial actors have the agency and the ability to not just act as conduits for transactions, but actually catalyze change. Um, they support innovation from seed funding to ultimately scale up and then ultimately decide really what is distributed. And so we need to be really getting involved in how funding mechanisms are structured and what it is and the kinds of returns that these financial actors are looking at to ensure that the viability of our food systems takes priority. Um, so, you know, loan guarantees and guaranteed volume buying and um, you know, in investment, ta uh, innovation tax credits have all been really successful in ensuring access to critical medical technologies in different parts of the developing world. And I believe we can do similar things to leverage both public and private capital to ensure um, that we can really see the power of food innovation on our plates. Um, and then finally, um, and this is my last point, is on the need for open access, open source innovation and distributed manufacturing. Um, we talked a lot about um, low resilience, um, primarily because of a hyper-connected food um, system. I think we need to build in more nodes. We need to build in more, we need more participation from different players on the global food system um, to ensure that we're adding diversity into what we're eating and what's being traded. 60% um, of the population is in Asia. It's imperative that this region and others in Latin America and the Middle East and Northern Africa form a critical part of this food systems transition that we're um, looking to institute. And in order to do that, there's a need to develop diverse open source technologies that are both simple and cheap enough um, for farmers, for, you know, for um, large or small scale producers to be able to use and business models that are um, cost effective um, and that actually support transitions to these new food systems as well. Um, I will stop there. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I'm thinking that you, you're also touching on the same area. If I can invite Lena perhaps also so we can have these few minutes all together because you really put it into perspective um, the local to global scaling you know you're talking about the the potential we're working on the local level as well as the global uh, level and i think that is um interesting to touch base on you know if we're talking about a transformed food system how can we work or use um both the strength that we have on local level as well as on the global level anyone want to elaborate a little bit on that um, I can start off. I think we're both in agreement that um, a hyper local system is not the solution either. Um, mm. The idea is to really build in more modalities of where our food is coming from and who's trading these foods and who has access to these food production systems as well. So I think, um, unfortunately, what's happened over the last sort of 50 years is that we've kind of all morphed into a global standardized diet that you um, referred to as well, where we're eating primarily four different crops. These four crops are coming from, you know, four different countries. 
um, you know, they're being traded through um, routes that also ha are also very vulnerable to supply chain, um, um, supply chain disruptions. And so the idea really is to build in more resilience. And the only way you can do that is by empowering um, more production systems and different production systems. And um, I'm biased here, but I'm excited about food innovation. And I think food innovation is one solution and one area that can actually build in that diversity. But of course, there's multiple other considerations to be um, taken as well. Lena? I think you put it very well, uh, Nicole, cause, and I totally agree. There isn't a way, uh, I think there's so much uh, we can do by enhancing this local uh, diversity and production and innovation and I think that's uh, I can see a lot in the future also being where that part is enhanced but then also drawing on some of the uh, the the good things about the global food system because we are um, interdependent on each other and that brings also good things to it I mean there are places ar around the world where climate change is going to hit so much worse than in other places we expect in Sweden that maybe it's even more positive for our, our agricultural production, actually, with a bit of a warming here. We may see more extreme events, but in general, this sort of can be positive. But other places around the world are going to be very hard hit with a massive reduction in productivity, for example. And then I don't think that the solutions can be only about what can we do in our local place, because um we, we really need to sort of find a way of um uh, both supporting each other and 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 trading uh where we need increase um consumption in some places where others have better uh, circumstances for production also so it is about kind of navigating that local and global uh yeah. and it's not a simple answer to it <laughs> Like, mm -hmm. like all the answers in this discussion, it's very complex. Yeah. And, and I wish we had, you know, a few days more that we can continue discussing this. Um, and I think this, uh, as you mentioned, um, Lina, in, in our perspective, a lot of crises also kind of draw the attention to self-sufficiency, but uh, not forgetting that we are all independent on each other as well going forward. Um, we're soon to wrap up, but I just wanted to um, kind of test a little bit with you. During the summit in October, we had a speaker, Professor Corina Hawkes, and she was talking about uh, our sick food system. Um, and she kind of, uh, I think, related it to be an August, uh, or, um, organism uh, who was struggling and being sick. So. If you were giving the opportunity now to prescribe an action point for a sick food system, what would that be? And you have like two minutes to share. So uh, don't think about it too long. Um, it's diff really difficult, but it's more about what would you say, you know, kind of concluding, where do we need to focus right now? And it's very awkward if you leave it quiet now and we just have a countdown for two o'clock. Maybe I can I, I jump <laughs> in then, but I, I mean, yeah. I had my four things and the, the shifting diet, circular systems, cutting food loss and waste, uh, being more like enhancing sustainability of production systems and then do that while protecting nature. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is this kind of diversification and innovation. I think that's another and, and navigating the uh, the hyper connectivity in the world, what we talked about, the local to the global. Oh, I think those are, are a few uh, places. Also to say that I like the analogy oh. of a sick food system rather than a broken food system maybe, uh, because I think we have a system that can do so much for us and helps us so much in building a better society already, but we need to, it needs some medicine right now, maybe to become even better. Yeah. Do you have a quick comment there? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll go back to the idea of food innovation. I think we need to be thinking about innovation very differently. I think something that works in 
the US or in Sweden will not necessarily work in India, for example, or other parts of the emerging world. So we really need to be thinking about context um, when we're doing, I mean, um, research and innovation is great, but all of this needs to be, um, it needs to be contextualized. Um, we need to ensure that there's long term um, uh, relationships that are being built out with stakeholders in different parts of the world. We need to make sure that we have provisions for safety nets for those that might be affected by a transformation of this kind. Mm -hmm. um, we need to be making sure that we're, we're understanding how all of these nodes kind of affect one another um, and make sure that we're planning um, for resilience in a way that we haven't done before. Great um, last words. We really need to plan something um, going forward that we haven't seen before. But with that, um, we need to wrap up. And a huge thanks to you both for giving us insights and having this discussion. And thank you all for listening. And I hope you all got some new ideas and thoughts and, and information and everything well, most of it uh, that we were talking about during the summit is also available on the website, including uh, the talk on the sick uh, food system. So please have a look at that. Um, and um, I wish you all the best of the day. Bye.